I'm John Griffiths. I'm the chair of the Welsh Parliament's Equalities Local Government and Communities Committee. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight to say good evening to everyone and croeso to this very important event, which is the last of this year's Golad Events Programme held by the Senedd. Tonight I'm joined by Anne Wen and Ruth, both of whom are members of Wales' first youth parliament. They will be discussing the important matter of youth homelessness with Francis Beecher, Chair of End Youth Homelessness Cymru and Chief Executive of Chlamai, and with actor and patron of End Youth Homelessness Cymru, Michael Sheen. Could I ask you both Francis and Michael just to briefly introduce yourselves and say a little bit about why this issue is so important to you? Francis. Um, well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and a massive thanks to our patron um, of End Youth Homeless Cymru as well. Um, I think this is such an important issue because we are letting young people down in Wales. For every 10 years that we allow youth homelessness to continue, we are losing a generation. And I think it's even more important now because as a consequence of this awful pandemic, we're going to hit a recession um, and we have Brexit round the corner, which is going to impact and make things worse. We cannot allow anyone to say that it's too difficult to end youth homelessness. Um, you can end it. And as far as I'm concerned, we made that commitment and we've got till 2027 to do it. OK, thank you, Francis. And Michael? Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Hello, Fran. Uh, hello to everybody, uh, Ruth and Anwen as well. Um, I suppose, really, the reason that I got involved around this issue is because it's it's just wrong. <laughs> it's uh, it's wrong. No one should be without a home, a safe place to live. Who needs it? That's um, of any age, but particularly young people, um, and especially young people who have already uh, not been given the same chances as everyone else because of whether it's family circumstances um, or, or whatever it might be. Um, and we'll come on to talk a bit more about that later, but um, it's, it's heartbreaking and uh, uh, hugely anger making, it's not even a word, um, to see that um, people who have already struggled with so many different things, far more than ever I had to struggle with, um, would be put in a position where they're, they're not able to have a safe place to live. So it seems an outrage to me. And, um, and I wanted to do whatever I could and use whatever resources I have to be able to do just, you know, whatever small amount I can do to, to, to help. OK, well, thank you, Francis. And thank you, Michael, very much for that. Um, as I said initially, I chair the Equalities Local Government and Communities Committee in the Senedd, and we have done quite a lot of work on homelessness and rough sleeping um, over the term of this particular assembly. And that's involved speaking to a lot of people with lived experience of rough sleeping and homelessness, and that's really brought it home to the committee in terms of the impact that people have experienced in their lives and all of the consequences um, that flow from that. And many of the people we have spoken to have been young people. And certainly hearing of that experience has been a driving force behind the committee's decision to prioritise this work, to produce reports and to scrutinise Welsh Government on its actions, strategy and policy. And I'm pleased to say that I, I do think, you know, thanks to people like Francis and Michael and the work that they're doing and many others, we have seen real progress in the last few years. And whilst government has committed considerable resource and effort in uh, attempting to address these problems, I mean, they are deep seated and they are multifaceted, as, as it's said, you know, they're not easy to deal with because there are so many factors that lead to homelessness and rough sleeping. But there has been a big effort from government agencies and others to pull together uh, and to seek answers. 
And this was given fresh impetus during the pandemic as well. And, you know, we've, re we've seen real progress in getting people off the streets into suitable accommodation with services um, pulled around them. And of course, the challenge now is to sustain that and not to see uh, any slippage away from the progress that's been made. So as a committee, we will continue to scrutinise Welsh Government and to work with all the services um, and agencies to try and make sure that we do sustain that progress and build on it and improve upon it. Um, so that's something we'll be doing for the rest of this assembly term, which um, runs up until um, spring next year, uh, when we'll be having fresh elections. Okay, well, I'm now going to hand over chairing duties for this event to Anwen and Ruth, and they will be the ones asking the questions tonight, um, quite, quite rightly. Michael, you frequently used your position to draw attention to the issue of homelessness and youth homelessness in particular. For instance, at the Homeless World Cup last year, what is it that drives you to want to help young people who are homeless? Uh, thanks, Anwen. Um, I suppose uh, building on what I was saying earlier, really, that, um, that it just seems, uh, on a very basic level, it seems outrageous that we as a nation are not able to make sure that anyone, but especially young people um, who don't have somewhere safe to live, um, are not able to be looked after properly. I, I think that's an outrage. Um, and, um, and, and during the, you know, the, the pandemic, it's shown what can happen when there is a will to make it happen, to, to, to get people off the streets, to get them somewhere safe, you know, that it is possible. It's partly a psychological shift, I think, isn't it? To, uh, rather than to, to, to move away from managing a problem and to solve the problem. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a choice that can be made. It's not a choice to be homeless, but it is a choice whether you want to solve it or whether you just want to manage it. Um, and I think that's a fundamental shift. And um, also to see that it's not random. Uh, the people who are most at risk of becoming homeless, it's not by chance or by accident. There are people who are more vulnerable and we know who those people are on the whole. Um, and it seems absolutely, I mean, it is heartbreaking to think that young people who are coming through the care system, so who have already lost a lot, who have already had to struggle a lot, who already don't have the opportunities and, uh, uh, and, and privilege that a lot of people have, certainly that I had growing up, um, the, people, the young people coming through the care system are more likely to become homeless than others. Um, that seems an outrage that just should not be acceptable. We should not, as a society, allow that to happen. Um, young people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, much more likely to become homeless because of you know, family breakdowns, uh, all kinds of difficulties that can come with, with, with just being part of that community. Um, young people with mental health issues. You know, we, there are all kinds of reasons that we know about that make certain people within our community more likely to be, to be in danger of becoming homeless. Um, and all those people are people who are already struggling far more than I ever struggled. Those are people who already deal with a lot more than ever I had to deal with. Um, and so me personally, I feel like, you know, I should therefore do whatever I can to make sure that I can do my part and everybody has a part to play. That's, that's sort of the point as well. You don't have to have the resources that I have. Everyone can do something. Um, and I feel like it's our duty as a society to make sure that uh, that nobody uh, is in that position. And you know, as I've got older, I'm I'm I have so much respect for for you and the others in the youth parliament because when I was your age, I was not thinking about what was going on for other people at all. I was, you know, that is something that has come to me much later in life, really, to 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 want to do something and find out more and be a part of making a change. I was so focused on on the things that I was obsessed with at that time, you know, and as I've got older, I've realized that, that, um, that I perhaps more than a lot of other people have a part to play and, and I want to be able to do that, especially around um, this issue. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is a question for Francis. Uh, what has the impact, uh, what impact has the pandemic had on youth homelessness in Wales? That's a really good question, Ruth. 
Devastating, I think, is my one word answer. We have seen a massive increase in youth homelessness. Um, just to give you an example, right at the beginning, many, many people, young people who were sofa surfing, so were staying with friends or relatives or friends of friends, immediately became homeless and literally had nowhere to stay. Um, so to give you some example, uh, Lamai has had to open four new projects during the pandemic just to try and keep up with the demand. We're just about opening our fifth and we have three more on the way for early new year. So we've seen an absolute massive tsunami in youth homelessness. Um, in our homeless helpline, we've seen a 100% increase in calls and we're just on, just to add our 200th call. Um, so it, it, it's actually drawn into the public sphere, I think. Um, youth homeless is often hidden because a lot of young people do did tend to sofa surf in. Um, the pandemic finished that. Um, so it was, uh, you know, we, we have significant waiting lists in 24 hour supported accommodation. Um, and we have a lot of young people who are still staying in unhealthy and dangerous places because they can't find somewhere to stay and they can't find somewhere safe. So we've seen massive increases in our advice and our mediation um, support as well, trying to um, ensure that no young person has to stay somewhere where, you know, inappropriate or unsafe. Um, you know, what I would say, it would be wrong of me not to say that a lot of youth organisations have worked really, really hard during the pandemic and Michael and my colleagues are no exception. Um, they have they have haven't stopped they worked as normal and in fact doubled their efforts so we've seen some great prevention and intervention services um we've done some great work with the police and uh, children's services to keep young people safe because we've seen a massive increase in county lines and sexual exploitation during the pandemic and we still have seen some amazing young people that Clamai have been supporting going off to university but I think what the pandemic has done is opened the curtains to an issue that previously was hidden. What are the additional challenges caused by the pandemic and does it present any opportunities to tackle youth homelessness? We've had a question in from Charlie from Caerphilly on this topic who wants to know how young people who haven't had the best start in life can be supported into employment. And this question is directed at Francis and John, and would John please take it first? There's a lot, a lot of work going on at the moment, and when um, to try and join up the devolved and non-devolved services when it comes to supporting young people with skills and training and getting into employment. And obviously with the pandemic, it's going to be absolutely crucial that the new schemes that are put together are effective and work. There's quite a history of this over, you know, recent, um, well, decades really. So we've got a lot of experience to draw upon to try and get it right. And I hope that we've learned some of those lessons about, you know, how meaningful the skills that are given are, how meaningful the work opportunities prove to be. I've had recent meetings with um, the local job centre, you know, in, in my area in Newport. And, um, you know, they tell me that they are well geared up for this. And a lot of resource and effort is, um, is going into meeting what they understand to be the scale of the challenge, you know, which is obviously very significant. So, you know, from a Welsh Government point of view, we, they've got to join up with um, UK Government and make sure that the partnership is effective and the joint working is effective. So there's a lot of sort of behind the scenes work that needs to take place to make sure that the actual experience of young people is positive. But I don't think any of us um, are in any doubts about the, you know, the, the immense nature of this challenge at this particular time. Um, we're getting through the public health emergency at the moment. Um, we're still in the middle of it, but we, you know, we see some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccination program and other developments but the economic impact is going to be with us for many years to come sadly and we have to make sure that we don't lose a generation of young people which has happened in the past when we're still today you know suffering the effects of what happened in the 1980s when a whole 
generation of young people didn't have the sort of opportunities that you know that they needed at that time we really got to pull out all the stops to make sure that that doesn't happen this time and i'll be part of the sort of scrutiny effort you know within the um the senate on the back benches and through the committee system but it's a big challenge for welsh government to tie up with uk government and make sure this works thank you john francis um Oh gosh, I want to try and be positive, um, but um, I'm, I'm struggling with the opportunities. Um, what I would say, we have seen great collaboration between services um, on homelessness, in particular homelessness around people sleeping rough. And we have seen a really impressive commitment, I think, from Welsh Government, ensuring the safety of those on the streets um, as best as possible. But the reality is that's meant that we've inevitably seen I guess take um, um, a, a, a move away and taking the eye off the ball of prevention and for young people um, and I think it was Sophie Howe who said and I've got a lot of time for Sophie she's a very wise woman she says in any crisis there's two phases um, the first way you respond and the second way you learn and I think to be to be successful you have to do both and I think you know, we've helped people off the streets. Uh, that response was really good. But unless we now focus on prevention services and looking at how people got onto the streets, what could have been done previously, and also how we stop a new generation of young people becoming rough sleeping, we will lose that generation, as, as John has said. Um, and I think that question on employment is 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 a very important question. We are very concerned about youth employment, um, particularly for the young people who've had very difficult starts in life. As, as Michael said, you know, their starts are, um, are, are something that I can't even imagine. Um, and we've, in so for example, in Clamai, we've run our employment and our training programs, Summerdom Line and Learning for Life, for years to try and address these issues. And these teams have been working flat out during the pandemic to work with homeless young people. And I'm very proud to say that we actually have had far better engagement um, numbers than, than our secondary schools. But however, unless we go into invest in those programs, you know, we have a work training education program set up in Wales. And as John says, unless we're going to negotiate well with um, uh, English government, we could see programmes of some of them line disappearing in Wales simply because we're small and nobody's thought about them. And these are the programmes targeted specifically for young people who are homeless or young people involved in the youth justice system, young people who are, uh, have been leaving care, young people who were traditionally right at the end of the queue. And I think it's beholden to all of us and Welsh Government to ensure that those young people don't get pushed even further as, as sadly we see a, a rise in unemployment. We have those systems, they've been validated, they've been researched to be shown to be pan-Europe leading. Let's use them and let's ensure we've got businesses who have said we will work with some of them line because we want to work for the young people of Wales. We need support from Welsh Government not to get lost in, in the plethora of discussions and talks with, um, with um, the English Government. Thank you, Francis. The GLAD events have really been about how we want the Wales of tomorrow to look. When we get through the worst of the pandemic, what does a better Wales look like to you? This is the question for Michael. Thank you, Ruth. Um, that is a massive question. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, the, and I suppose the first thing to say is we have no idea how long it will be when you talk about sort of dealing with the, with the pandemic. Um, there's a whole new landscape ahead of us. Um, the, the fallout from the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, we were, we're still living with. Um, the fallout from, from this crisis is going to be with us for a very long time. Uh, so so it, it's going to be a new shifting reality that we have to deal with for, for quite a while anyway. So any kind of vision for Wales has to, be, has to take that into account. The positive aspect of that, I think, 
is that because things have been so bad, um, it has forced everyone to, <clears throat> to think about reimagining everything that's happening. But within Wales, let's say just for Wales for now, we have to reimagine how our institutions work, how, uh, how our communities work, how our, our public services work. Um, what, what, what's important to us as a society. You know, the period of time that we've come through and that we're still going through, um, one of the positive things about it is that it has made it very clear what, what are the things that really matter to us? What are the things that we really need? And what are the things that need to be dealt with? You know, there's been an urgency to issues that were already issues, obviously, that people were working on before this pandemic, but it's made it very, very urgent because of how high the stakes have been. So to keep those at the forefront of our mind, you know, the, the status quo, a lot of people were frustrated with before this pandemic, and there will come a time when we find a new status quo. But this is a window of opportunity where things are able to be reimagined and reinvented, where innovation and creativity about dealing with the big problems of our society are up for grabs. Um, and, and again, that's why I think it's so important that everyone feels that they have a part to play in reimagining that. Um, what are the things that matter to you and what can you do about it now? No matter who you are, no matter what your uh, position is, you know, you can do something. And to engage with that now, I think is incredibly important. So I would love to see a Wales where every single member of the community feels engaged, feels that their voice can be heard and that we create a Wales that has an infrastructure in place that allows everyone's voice to be heard. You know, I'd love to see a Wales that is more connected in all kinds of ways. I'd love to see a Wales that is more psychologically connected to its past, to its history, where we, where we allow people to, to learn about the history of our nation, why things are the way they are, why we have different laws and different rules, and you know, why, why our country doesn't look like Scotland or Ireland or England. You know, we need to learn about that so that we're connected to our own past, so we can understand our present and create the future that we really want. Um, I want to see a Wales that is more connected in terms of places where people can share their opinions, share their views, share their stories. So that's about media and journalism, where every community feels that it has a voice and is represented and is heard and has access to accurate uh, uh, information, trustworthy information, uh, and where people are held to account that have power and authority over those communities. There are already amazing things going on in communities across Wales. And again, we've seen that a part of that during this pandemic, how people have pulled together to help those who need help, how, how communities have really stepped up. And that's been going on long before this pandemic and it will go on long afterwards. And I would like to see all those people who are hubs of their communities, people that I've met, that Fran knows about, that John will know about, people in their communities who don't have positions of power, but who use their position within the community for the benefit of that community. I would like to see those people connected up more and supported more and for opportunity and wealth to not just stop at the edge of Cardiff, for it to go out into the whole of Wales so that we're connected more in that way as well. And, you know, if we're talking about connection, uh, I'd also like to see our infrastructure in Wales make it maybe a little less difficult to get from South Wales to North Wales. It's sort of ridiculous that you would have to go into another country to get to another part of your own country. That infrastructure, and there's stuff to learn about that, about our history. You know, during the Industrial Revolution, the infrastructure in Wales was created to get stuff out of Wales. That's why everything was, you know, not about connecting the country, it was about getting it out. And I am a product of that as well, in that my pathway uh, in my job led me out of Wales as well. The raw material of Wales needs to stay connected to Wales, not be taken out, whether it's um, actual raw materials, you know, that we dig up from the ground or whether it's the raw material that's in each one of us, our own talents. We need to make a Wales that, that means that you don't have to leave Wales to be a success, that actually you can stay here and there is plenty for you to do. So I would love to see a connected Wales. I agree with so much of what Michael just said. Um, this is a question directed at John and Francis. What do you see as the main priorities to prevent youth homelessness? Well, I think um, on the broader front, I think Michael's put it very well, hasn't he? Very effectively and very passionately that there are so many things we need to do to make Wales a better country. And if we could do those things, then it would tackle all of the social and economic evils that we suffer at the moment, including youth homelessness. 
Um, so generally, if we, you know, there, there's so much that needs to be done to create that fair and more equal Wales that would really address the vulnerabilities that particular sections of community have um, and would, I think, do a lot to, um, to address youth homelessness as well as so much else. And, you know, as Michael said, there's an opportunity now coming through the pandemic. Within Welsh Government, Jeremy Miles, one of the ministers, is tasked with doing work to build back better, to understand what opportunities we have to make sure that we don't go back to the old status quo, as Michael said, that, that we create a new, better country, learning the lessons of the experience of the pandemic. And the committee I chaired did some work on some of the... Um, the issues that have come to the fore during COVID-19 and you know it's no surprise it wouldn't surprise any of us that you know the people who are already suffering the worst inequalities and and difficulties in our society have suffered most during the virus as well um, so you know we need to understand that and we do need to create a better Wales given the opportunity that the pandemic offers I mean you know it's absolute misery obviously during COVID-19, but it does give some opportunities to create that better country. So I think generally that, you know, a lot that we should do in general will help deal with youth homelessness as well. And then there are the particular issues around um, young people and rough sleeping and homelessness. Some of the issues, again, that, you know, Michael mentioned earlier, things like um, the way that the, the care system works, um, mental health issues, um, some of the issues around our education system and exclusions from school, um, as well as the, you know, the more general inequalities. So we have to make sure that specialist services and agencies are ever more effective to deal with the particular issues. But if we dealt with the general issues and made progress there, that would go a huge way um, towards creating a sort of Wales that wouldn't see youth homelessness as, as such an issue. Thank you, John. Francis? Um, first of all, can I just say I couldn't agree with, uh, with Michael Moore. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of listening to him previously. Um, and um, my dad, um, a very wise man, always says, know your history. If you don't know your history, you're condemning yourself to making the same mistake. So I just want to say thank you. So what I would say is, look, we are actively allowing young people to become homeless in Wales. It's a choice. These are young people who under the law are children. Okay, and local authorities are supposed to leave corporate parents. And as far as I'm concerned, um, local, you know, anyone who allows a child of theirs to become homeless, especially when you're in a corporate position, we need to be doing something about. Um, I'd also say that 50% of rough sleepers were homeless before the age of 21. So there is a very stark reason why, if we eradicate youth homelessness, we actually stop that tide becoming more and more going forward. So we have to invest in better targeting of preventative services, knowing what we already know. What is so frustrating is whilst you know, we continue to research, I am sick to death of all the reports on homelessness and youth homelessness. I'm sick to death of it. There is none that I've done, and sadly I've been around for far too long, that isn't coming up with the same conclusions. And I really think we have to say no more reports, we need to take action. Because we know, for instance, as, as Michael said at the beginning, some groups of young people are at greater risk. Um, young people leaving care. We know the transition into other services um, as they become adults are also a risk of falling, falling off the cliff. So we know that one third, I think it's one third of care leavers become homeless in the first two years immediately after they leave in care. I mean, sorry, I know I'm not allowed to swear, but what the actual, you know, we know that the young people that are going to fall off this cliff are the young people who are not in foster, um, a stable foster placement or have had more than two care homes. We know who these young people are that are going to become homeless in two years time. Do not tell me that is not neglect on behalf of uh, the corporate parent. 
why haven't we developed a system that allows a pathway that doesn't um, ensure that that young person, for example, could move into supported accommodation or supported lodgings and they start talking to them about it at the age of 14 and 15 because of their history. So that young person is thinking, hang on, I've got options. There's things that could happen to me rather than waiting for them to fall off that cliff. They become traumatized. They get abused in a system and very often it can be over 12 months before that young person then becomes back to the attention of the so-called services. That can't be allowed to happen any longer. Um, we also know, as Michael said, again, um, LGBTQ plus young people are four times more likely to become homeless. Um, so again, we should know, we know that there are groups of young people who are far more vulnerable these are the young people that we should be looking out for um, and doing it earlier so just to give you an example Shamai runs a, a program called upstream Cymru. upstream is a collaborative target intervention that works through schools to identify young people at risk of homelessness well before they come, you know, they, they, they lose their homes when there's issues going on at a young age. Um, and Upstream is replicating a Welsh model that happened in Australia and saw a 40% decrease in youth homelessness um, uh, sort of presentations. So I guess what I'm saying is what I would hope is that the main priorities is we no longer accept the same old excuses. As Michael says, we actually reinvent. We know what works. We know the young people that are going to end up homeless. So let, let's, let, let's work with them um, so they don't get to the point of becoming homeless. Thank you both for your very passionate responses. Um, so some young people who have experienced homelessness, including Lee and Zoe, have asked why is it have asked why is it so hard for them to get support for mental health problems, partic particularly at an earlier stage. They both felt that early help with mental health would have helped prevent their homelessness. This question is for Francis. Oh goodness, what what a, a brilliant question! Um, I really really wish I had the answer to that. Um, I think most of the problems are a, a, an easy way into early support and a system that sadly means that some of our mental health services are in crisis. I know, and I read the Youth Parliament's own um, report on the issue, I think it was Let's Talk About Mental Health. Um, and that really did highlight um, some of the important issues because you're absolutely right, there is a massive issue and there is a real link to homelessness. Clamai did a five long year research programme with Cardiff University and we found that nearly 90% of the young people that we um, are privileged to work with had a mental health problem and over 80% had a diagnosis then of a lifelong um, problem with mental health. What's really hard to understand as well is, you know, which is the chicken and which is the egg. Because the reality is, is when you live in a life of poverty, when you're shifted from pillar to post, when you have no stability in your life, when you have no one that is that um, consistent, constant adult in your life, that can exacerbate anybody's mental health problem. So I really feel that the issue is a huge challenge for the next government. Um, and you know, there are lots of factors which, which add to, to the issues of, of, of mental health, poverty, as I mentioned, but also the reality is, is not knowing where you're going to be spending the night, not knowing if you're going to be safe, not next week, but also not knowing um, where the abuse is going to come from, because for many young people, the roof that they're under is the roof that means that they are being traumatized and abused and that is adding to to the problem of mental health so we need more capacity for the mental health system but also what we need is more services at the um at the first levels so for example you know Clamai has as part of our research into um 
our work with Cardiff University, we were able to show that the support that the organisation gives, that psychologically informed support, actually academically proved that it was in, enabled around 60% of the people we're privileged to work with to manage their mental health, to manage and understand themselves better, to make better use of, of GPs, to make better use of services, and to understand their own up and ups and downs and how they respond to certain crises in their life. So we need that, we need that um, investment in those frontline services um, but also an ability that appointments don't require months and months and months. And the other issue we've got is, as I say, that transition, for example, from CAMS to adult services. It is sometimes so complicated and, and, and so difficult. Um, and it's talking therapies that can support young people to manage their own mental health, to understand that we all have mental health issues. It is a spectrum. It is something we can all talk about. And the more we all talk about it, and the more we all um, recognize that everyone is on a spectrum and, and it's okay to talk, it's okay not to be okay, and it's okay to ask for help and support. And the one plea I would make is that I cannot stand when I hear um, people saying it wasn't a serious attempt at self-harm or suicide. It is always a cry for help. People, people's behaviours are a way of communicating. And we have to understand that when you're in a mental health crisis, when your mental health is deteriorating, young people don't often know how best to communicate. And the reality is neither do the rest of us. So let's look at behaviours as a way of communicating and listen and understand and learn from, from young people. And, you know, the Youth Parliament's report was well worth reading and I hope Welsh Government are taking note of it because with you taking this issue seriously, I hope we'll start to see some positive changes. Thank you, Francis. This question is directed at Francis and John. We've had questions. Th we've had questions through from Angharad, Tanika, and Abby, who want to know why isn't there more safe emergency accommodation for young people available in Wales, and what needs to happen to make sure there is enough affordable housing for young people? And if we could have John to answer this question first, please. You can vote, Anne. Well, I think um, in terms of the wider picture, we're not doing nearly enough in terms of building affordable housing in Wales, and we haven't done for quite a number of years. We saw the social housing stock depleted by things like the right to buy policy, which um, didn't just sell off um, what started off at the time as council housing quite cheaply, but didn't allow the receipts that local authorities received to be reinvested in <coughs> building new social homes. Um, so we've been playing catch up for quite some time. And now we need to find new models, new models of getting the numbers of um, affordable um, housing units up to the sort of level where we could make inroads into a lot of the housing related problems that we have. I think thankfully, a lot of the housing associations have really stepped up to the mark and they're doing a lot more now. Um, they've widened the sphere of their activities. Um, they're doing a lot more building, you know, for different purposes to sell as well as to rent. And they've got a lot more services knitted around the accommodation that they provide, recognising the wider role that, that they can play. So all of that is good. But, you know, in housing terms in general, I think we've got quite um, a sort of... Um, outdated and unimaginative model. A lot of the house building is still the major house builders pursuing their traditional models. It's what works for them in terms of their profits. Um, and it doesn't really address the housing need that we have in Wales. So, you know, we could do a lot more in terms of housing co-ops, building further on the work of the housing associations, um, having some more smaller scale um, developments rather than the sort of general approach which favours lots of large greenfield um, developments. Um, so we do, you know, undoubtedly we need to make a lot of 
progress in general. But within that, then again, as we were saying earlier, there'll be specific issues in terms of um, housing for young people. And in the work that my committee, the, um, the Equalities Committee did on rough sleeping and homelessness more generally, we did note concerns in the evidence that we took um, of a lack of suitable emergency accommodation. And that was right across the board for all age um, ranges. Um, but, you know, some of that engagement we, we did and the lived experience that, um, that we heard about um, did highlight some of the inadequacies and some of the unsuitability of current provision. You know, th things like floor space um, in hostels, um, temporary accommodation and people's experience of that. And, you know, a lot of people told us, young people and people of all ages, that they, you know, they just didn't feel safe. Um, and, you know, that, that's a massive problem, isn't it? You're not going to get people into what's provided if, uh, if they don't feel safe when they go there and, they, you know, they're certainly not going to stay there and they're not going to go back there under those sorts of circumstances. So we didn't specifically focus as a committee on youth um, homelessness and rough sleeping um, rather than the more general picture. So, you know, again, I'd be very interested to hear um, what Francis um, has to say. Um, but, you know, in terms of those wider problems, those, those were our findings. Thank you, John. And Francis? Oh, goodness me, I could talk for forever on this one. Um, it's an absolute disgrace, quite frankly, and it, it's down to money. Um, the reality is we're dealing, you know, we are talking about children under the law um, who should have already been identified, at least 50% of them already identified. And for those young people who become homeless, um, with, without any sort of forewarning, there should be safe supported accommodation that is not frightening, that is, um, that is a place where a young person can start to feel safe, where they can start to relax, when they can start to look at what they want out of life and that they can move forward. Small home-like environments. This is why there has to be a youth strategy for young people. You cannot dump young people into rough sleeping, the generic homeless population. They are children under the law and they deserve to have, um, to have, as I said, small home-like environments where they can get to know a few, of, a few of them, where they feel like there's a family, where they, where they are getting the support that, that that they need. And we've worked really hard to change this situation, and we've tried to amplify the voices of young people um, to those in power. Um, you know, and I do acknowledge Welsh Government are now sort of demanding further improvements so that floor spaces are no longer acceptable. But the reality is, I'm sorry, in 2019, 2020, regardless of a pandemic, are you telling me it is right to put a young child, 16, in a, on a floor, in a hostel, or in a space where there's 52 other people? They are bound to feel scared. They are bound to vote with their feet because they will, um, they will not stay where they don't feel safe. And whilst a lack of good affordable housing is, is a huge issue, and I, I understand it's a global problem, we need specific support and supported accommodation for young people and then appropriate move on when they're ready and when they feel able. I mean, we at Clamai is working with, um, I think, I don't know if I'm allowed to say Housing Association, but I will, United Welsh, to develop a housing association specifically for young people, which is focusing on what young people need and want so that they can then move from supported accommodation seamlessly through to a to a place that they want to. Um, but we've got to keep hammering on the doors of politicians for this issue. And what I would say, it's a prime time now to the run-up election because they need to hear from you to know that um, young people should not be placed in emergency accommodation. There should be provision already um, available for them. 
because we can identify those young people. We know the numbers of young people who are in social services care. We can work out how much is needed. And what we cannot allow is people to, to use budgets not to provide that service. Thank you, Francis. Or Francis again, sorry. Um, we've also had questions from Anthony and Amelia who have both been supported by Hlamai's Tea Pride project, which is a specific supported housing project for LGBTQ plus, for uh, LGBTQ plus young people. They want to know what, what would you like to see change in the way that LGBTQ plus people are treated, in particular around the issue of youth homelessness. Um, well, first of all, I want to say hi, um, and I hope I saw you at T Pride's Pride event because we had an amazing, amazing time on that. Um, and I'd also um, like to say a massive thank you to, to Michael because he um, really um, pushed at the uh, Homeless World Cup, a fantastic, um, a t fantastic film that highlighted the issue of LGBTQ young people um, who were at particular um, risk of homelessness. As I said earlier, four times more likely to become homeless. And I think it was because Michael was able to get the um, the airtime and the focus um, um, and we had some local authorities who came to that event that um, actually led to us being able to develop um, the Wales's first LGBT um, specific project um, and we work with our partners Viva and Denbyshire to set up T-Pride to start offering that support. It's been an absolute massive success um, because it's because it's basically a project that is run with and by LGBT young people and LGBTQ plus um, support colleagues who understand what um, young people are going, going through. And we really are pushing to see, um, to try and develop at least four or five projects for LGBTQ plus young people across Wales, because the reality is sadly, due to intolerance and homophobia and family relationship breakdown you know these young people have to have the support that that is needed and we know that there's anecdotally i guess that there's huge and measured needs so we do need the help and support of local authorities to capture that data better to help us understand how many lgbtq uh, plus young people are experiencing homelessness. I think as well what's absolutely vitally important and EYHC's report led on this is that local authorities, colleagues and staff have to have intensive training to understand how to sensitively work with LGBTQ plus young people, ask the right questions and offer the right support. Um, and I would, um, I must say, this is something we're really conscious of um, in Lamai. And, you know, our training is led by Stonewall Cymru, but also, very importantly, led by LGBTQ plus young people who tell our colleagues what's important for them, what matters to them. And, you, you know, it's, it's the experts by experience that, that we really, really need to, to be listening to. Um, and I hope that in 2021, Wales can, can, you know, can rightly become a place where LGBTQ plus young people have the same rights, the same support that um, their, their, their non-gay homeless um, peers have. Thank you. Uh, this next question is directed at Michael and Francis. With the Senate election coming up in May, what would you both like to see the next Welsh, Welsh government doing about youth homelessness and on wider problems in Wales that contribute to homelessness, like poverty? Uh, Michael, if you'd like to take this question first. Well, um, I think, you know, uh, Fran has already talked about it, but I, one of the things that I learned in, the, in working on uh, the Homeless World Cup, bringing the Homeless World Cup here and talking to people, one of the things that has really stayed with, with me was that um, someone said, uh, when homelessness does occur, um, it should be what the aim is to make sure that it's uh, rare, short, and non-recurring. And that has really stuck with me. Um, and 
you know, you want it to be short. So you want to make sure that anytime someone is finding themselves in a position where they don't have safe accommodation, that whatever the, 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 the support that can be given at that point of crisis is in such a way that it means that it doesn't have to, that experience doesn't have to last very long. You want it to be non-recurring so that there is support there. It's not just about buildings. It's about making sure that people have this wraparound support to make sure that they can stay in those in that accommodation. And the thing that has really stuck with me and, and, and that your question has brought up for me is to make it rare. So it's about prevention. It's what Fran was talking about earlier. You know, a lot of attention uh, understandably goes on the point of crisis, emergency accommodation. What happens when someone's, you know, in this situation? Of course it does, because that's the stakes are very high. But the most important thing I think, and, and that I would love to see much more work go into, is that preventative stuff. To look at what are the factors that create uh, someone's uh, vulnerable to becoming homeless. As Fran was saying, as I was saying earlier, you know, we know the people who are like more likely to, to to find themselves in that position. So I would love to see far more work go into giving people, specifically young people, the support earlier so that you never get to that point. And there are all kinds of economic arguments to be made about that. The money that can be saved by making sure that you're not constantly dealing with crisis and constantly dealing with crisis with the same people because it is recurring because they haven't been given the proper support to, to not go back into that situation. So I'd love to see much more attention, much more focus, much more support upstream as, as Fran talks about earlier on to, to, to make sure that that happens. That's what I'd love to see. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Francis? I'd love to see a recommitment to ending youth homelessness. The Welsh Government made that commitment um, a few years back and I want to see um, a reinvestment and a recommitment to ending homelessness. Um, I would really call on um, seeing youth homelessness taken seriously as a distinct issue that requires distinct solutions and a distinct strategy because young people are experiencing homelessness at a key developmental period in their lives. That's both mentally, physically, socially, and emotionally. They need different strategies. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge that, you know, if you're a young person, you're not gonna have experience of independent living. You're not going to be, um, you're not an adult. You know, why is that so hard for people to grasp? They are not adults. They're tr treated differently under the law. Um, young people have different access to some benefits and generally they earn lower incomes than, than older adults when they're able to access work. Um, so, and, and some young people, because of their poor starts in life, will have involvement with youth specific systems. Um, we talked about care systems or youth justice systems, um, which increase their risk of, of homelessness. So. Without a distinct strategy, they will always be an add-on or a supplement or and of course. Um, and, and that is something that, that causes me great angst, it's, you know, as much anger as when I see, you know, um, four Wales see England and lots of strategy documents across, across the bridge. And I get just as angry when I see for homelessness you know, read youth homelessness. No, it's completely different. And it is wrong to ask young people to navigate youth homelessness services. That is inappropriate and outdated. And there is no reason why we can't change that system. So I would like, as I say, that youth homelessness strategy and linking it up with the child poverty strategy as well. And absolutely everything Michael just said as well. Thank you, Francis. Um, Michael, how important is it that we hear the voices of young people when we discuss issues like this? Uh, well, it's fundamentally important, I think. Um, the, uh, the experiences of the people that the, you know, organizations like Shamai are trying to help, those experiences, they can only help if we know exactly what those experiences are, You that the experts, in this area are the people who are going through it, the young people who are actually going through it. So without their um, experiences and testimony uh, uh, and stories at the heart of all the work that goes on around this, it's it can come to naught. So it has to be there. And I think as part of a wider um, attitude towards 
uh, solving problems and creating uh, provision of services. Uh, the lived experience of the people who are actually going through those issues has to be at the heart of it. It can't be other people deciding what's best for these people going through stuff. It has to come from, from them. And, and, and that's, that's, you'd think that that would be common sense. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's sort of quite rare um, because of the way that um, uh, the way that funding works, the way that you know certain boxes have to be ticked, the way strategies are put together. Um, it can often mean that the actual voice of the people who are at the heart of those experiences is the is the smallest voice in the room. And um, so, in this particular case around youth homelessness, um, the young people who are going through it are absolutely fundamental to it. And it's why. I have been um, so supportive of, of End Youth Homelessness Cymru and the work that the people like Fran are doing because, you know, it, the young people always are at the heart of it. Everything that I've had to do with it, every involvement I've had has always had the stories of, of the young people there. And that's been what has been most, uh, has taught me the most, has inspired me the most and has galvanized me the most to keep working in this area. So it's fundamentally important. Thank you. So this question is directed at Francis, Michael and John. What do you think of the fact that young people have been given the vote in Wales? Do you think that this will make a difference for how young people are treated by politicians in Wales in the future? Uh, if John, could you please answer first? Yes, so thank you very much, Angwen. I'm very, very supportive <clears throat> of giving the vote to young people in Wales, 16 and 17 year olds in um, Senedd, and um, local government elections. And um, I'd like to see it done more widely still in the future. I think basically, um, you know, young people at that age have got lots and lots of views on things that are particularly important to them. They've got lots and lots of views on matters more widely and generally. Um, they have got opinions. They, you know, they develop them in schools through some of the work that goes on in schools. And I hope that will be stronger still under the new curriculum that we're developing in Wales at the moment, um, you know, they have got a voice and um, it's legitimate that that voice is expressed through elections at 16 and 17 years of age. And there are lots of anomalies that people point to, lots of things you can and can't do at 16 and 17. But I think, you know, having the vote, having the right to register and use that vote is absolutely crucial. And yes, politicians and political parties will take young people and young people's issues more seriously as a result of them having that vote. You know, that's the way the political systems work. Um, when political parties are working at their manifestos, developing their policies and strategies, making their commitments, communicating around election time and in between elections, they will now have 16 and 17 year olds more to the fore of their minds and at the center of their activities. So, you know, it's a big opportunity for 16 and 17 year olds to register to vote. And obviously that's the first stage and to use those votes to get their voices heard and to help shape what happens in the future, you know, around schools, around colleges, around universities around all of the issues that matter to them, including, of course, youth homelessness. So, you know, I just very much hope that young people in Wales take this opportunity now, and I'm sure that they will. Thank you, John. Michael? Thanks, Edwin. <clears throat> um, yes, as John uh, alluded to there, it's a sad truth that um, equal rights and for people's struggles to be acknowledged and dealt with effectively has never been given um, without uh, resistance. People are not given equality, uh, unfortunately, by those in positions of power freely. It comes with struggle and it comes with get, becoming franchised. The, you know, for, for working people to be represented uh, politically, it took you know many many uh, uh, people to bring it, but the Chartists struggle. Um, for the suffragettes, to get women the vote, for, for the civil rights movement to bring uh, African-Americans the vote, black people the vote, um, whether it's, you know, the work of Stonewall and all the struggles that have gone in the LGBTQ+, and that is continuing to go on now. Um, it, 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 until you get the franchise, your struggles will not be taken seriously and they won't be met with effective solutions. So for young people to be able to have the chance 
to vote in these in these elections is is a is a real milestone, um, and you know it's too easy to um, to just sort of ignore and push aside and uh, and and minimize the uh, what 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 young people are are able to do. What you know, in the same way, it, all you have to go back. You don't have to go back too far, scarily, to look at the way black people were talked about in America, or the way you know gay people were talked about, or whatever it might. Working people were talked about. It wasn't that long ago, uh, and you'll see a lot of similarities to the people who argue for why sixteen-year-olds shouldn't get the vote. Um, it's irresponsible. They don't know what they, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was exact, the exact same things were being said about all those other people whose struggles were eventually uh, listened to and met and, 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 and given proper representation. So I think it's a, a, a really fantastic thing. And, and I think it's going to be uh, transformative in many ways. Thank you, Michael. Francis? I just completely agree with what Michael and John have said. I mean, what I would say within Tlamai, you know, no model of support, no, no innovation, no development. For example, the Youth Homeless Helpline was set up. Um, Michael came and, and um, you know, actually, I think it was about 120 in the end of all lots of young people who said, this is what's needed. Um, and if they are capable of showing what's needed to end homelessness, they are certainly capable of voting and putting the pressure on. And, um, you know, obviously it's down to every individual right, but we will trying to make sure that every young people ex exercises their right to vote um, and amplifies their voice because um, um, in Clamai, we listen to the voices of the experts by experience. The organization has developed because of their voices. And I am very happy and very confident that they can set their political agenda going forward. Thank you all for your answers. And lastly, for Michael and Francis, what do you think we can do as youth parliamentarians and young people in general to help young people who are homeless today? Uh, Francis, can you go first? Yes, sure. Um, what I would say to you um, is that having the youth parliament and having young people gives me great hope for the future. It's the one light that I can see uh, um, alongside the vaccine coming because you are, the tr you are the future. And what I would say is speak truth to power. It will get you in trouble. It does get into me into quite a lot of trouble, but it, it's never stopped me, so you go for it. And keep on at the politicians. Um, the reality is, is they're listening more intently now with the election coming up. So please write to them, email them, and please tell them that you want to see their party delivering a youth homelessness strategy tell them you want to see more supported accommodation and more housing for young people to address the poverty and the mental health crisis that too many young people are going through. Um, and, you know, amplify the voices of some of the young people who, because they are struggling with life, cannot raise their own voices now, but with help and with support, their voices will be amplified and believe you me, they will become leaders of the future. They are leaders of the future. Um, and tell those politicians you want to see an end to youth homelessness. And I guess my final thing is please, everybody, young people, keep an eye on your friends. What we know is it's peers that support peers and you are more important to your friends than adults you know, me mouthing off anyone else, okay? If you know a friend is struggling, um, tell someone, ask them, you know, tell, ask for help. And if you know that they are sleeping on sofas, if you know that they don't know where they're going to be spending next week, they are homeless. Very often young people don't even recognise they're homeless. They need to know they're homeless and we can help. Thanks to our helpline that we, we, we work with, with Shelter Cymru now, there's 24 hours support out of hours. There is someone on the end of that phone that will work with that young person to find them a place of safety. So that number is 08000 495 495. Please look out for, for your friends. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And Michael? Well, I suppose I, I can only share with you my experience really, which was that when I um, started working on, on bringing the Homeless World Cup 
to Wales. Um, I tried to find out as much as I could. I tried to talk to as many people as I could, whether it was people like Francis, um, uh, who are you know delivering support, or um, people in in uh, uh, general practitioner surgeries, you know, um, people working on the reception desk at surgeries, um, people working at the Huggard, people who are, were actually going through homelessness themselves, whether it was young people or older people. I tried to get as much information as I possibly could, <clears throat> and slowly I started to have a bit more of an understanding of the of the size of the problem and the complexity of the problem. So one thing I would, you know, say is try to go below the surface of the understanding. You know, I, my, I, I had exactly the same attitude as a lot of people. Why are there so many empty buildings and so many people on the street? Why can't we just put them together? Surely there's a, a way to deal with that. Um, and that was, you know, became clear to me a very oversimplistic view of it and that it's much more complicated than that. Having said that, there are certain aspects of, of this issue that are simple. And I would urge you to never let go of that because the aspects of it that are simple are that it is an outrage, it should not happen, and it must be stopped. That's that You must never let go of the simplicity of that, because that is what will um, galvanize you and be the catalyst to, to keep you working in this area. You must never let go of the simplicity of that, that this unfairness and this injustice being done to people who deserve it the least, and no one deserves it, but, but the people who deserve it the least must not be tolerated. Um, if you can hold on to that, then the complexity of everything else you can engage with and you can have the, the, the courage and the energy to engage with, but never let go of that simple thing, that there, is, there are injustices and there is unfairness, and no matter how much you get sucked into meetings and sitting around tables and listening to people who, who sound like they know what they're talking about, and you get told, oh, there's not enough money for this, oh, well, you don't understand this, you don't understand that, that can start to just draw that energy away. That is the simple anger and outrage of unfairness that is going on in the world. Never let go of that, but do what you can to try and understand the real complexities and subtleties and nuances of issues, because without an understanding of that, we'll never get effective solutions. So hold the balance of those two things as best you can. And I wish you all the very best with that struggle. Thank you, Michael and Francis, for your responses. OK, well, that brings tonight's event and indeed this year's Gulad programme to a close. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Francis and Michael for their time tonight and, you know, for their commitment, for their passion um, on these crucial issues and all the work that they do and I'm sure will continue to do as hopefully we make more progress in dealing with these matters. And I'd like to say a great thank you, of course, to the young people who sent in their questions and our two Welsh Youth Parliament members, Anwen and Ruth, for leading us through the conversation and for representing our wonderful new Welsh Youth Parliament, which, as Francis rightly said, is such a beacon of hope, I think, for the future. And a big thank you to all of those who contributed to the other events that have made up this year's Gulad programme. The Ochenbauer, and no sway thought.